Hello and good evening or good afternoon or good morning wherever you are. This is the beauty of online global live streaming. I'm Eckhart Thiemann. I'm the artistic director of the Shabak Festival in London. Shabak, a window on contemporary Arab culture, is London's largest festival of contemporary Arab culture. We bring artists, both emerging and well-established artists, to London every two years in all art forms, from visual arts to literature, from cinema to music and theatre and dance. This year's festival takes place from the 20th of June to the 17th of July and much of it is online, so check out our website shubak.co.uk. And maybe I should also say that this event from tomorrow will be on our site so you can watch it again or can tell others. I'm very, very delighted that this, for the first time, we are collaborating with FADA to bring five events live from five different locations across the Arab region. And we'll start it off today from Khartoum in Sudan. Shubak has a long history of presenting Sudanese artists. The writer Laila Aboleila and Hamur Ziada spoke at our festival in 2015 and 2017. Um, the poet uh, Asadiq Al Raddi appeared with us in 2017. The musicians Rasha and Amira Khair played at Shubak, and this year's film program, which is delivered with the Safar Film Festival, has a special Sudanese focus. However, we have never directly collaborated with a location and an event and an organization in Khartoum itself. And we are really, really excited about this. This event came out, out of the necessity this year to, to have a reduced London program. In this pandemic year, we cannot invite as many artists to come to the UK as normal. But what it gave us is an amazing opportunity to reach out more into the region and see how can we have a closer connection and have Shubak a guest elsewhere and other organizations and events to be a guest with us. So when Hadil al Tayeb and Khaled al Bay from the FADA uh, network approached us, that call, that email came just at the right time where we felt this is the perfect moment to reconnect locations with artists and put them on an international platform and link them in with local communities. Just the right time, just the right partners and what exciting locations. So what really was born out of a moment of necessity and emergency has a wonderful spirit of generosity and hospitality. So it was a no-brainer, why should we not join forces with uh, Hadil and Khalib and be present in Khartoum, in Beirut, in Doha, in Marrakesh and in Gaza. So without further ado, I will hand over to Khaled, who will tell you much more about Fada, and then go straight into the heart of Khartoum. Thank you very much. ...and artist, a cultural cr creator from Sudan. I am also the founder of GetFada.com. Uh, with a great... ...with a group of uh, voluntary uh, team, uh, we put together a platform that is conceived from the idea of need for uh, individuals, artists to keep creating, especially in countries that don't have the institutional support for creatives. So we decided to build this platform to help you, to help individuals and institutions donate spaces and facilities to artists and creatives in their community offline. But then COVID hit. So everyone is had to think about how can we imagine the space? How can we help our, our team create COVID during this pandemic? So we did the same thing we always did. And we'll help, uh, artists keep creating by giving the institutions, giving these artists to keep creating, even though the institutions are closed. 
So the artist keeps working, the institutions have, uh, have a space, and when this institution is open again, they have a ready show, and they helped an artist work, and the space was actually activated by art. For Shabbat's team, in belief in the idea of Fada, of supporting artists, um, locations like Khartoum and Gaza. Unfortunately, artists don't get enough support. They're not normally in the, in, in the limelight. And giving them su the support today to be part of something as huge as Shabak. So we thank you very much uh, to Shabak. Our first stop is in Khartoum, Sudan. Uh, we have a first artist, I'm, is Omar Atif, an amazing cook. And he's based home. The first time we worked together, we worked for um, a book that I've put together with the help of Gota Institute and my friend Larissa uh, Farman. Uh, the book is called Sudan Retold. And what Omar is going to do today is do a reading from that book. Omar's work is about food and food archivist. That was what he calls himself. And he's spent the last year, actually, uh, compiling recipes from across uh, Sudan comic book, Sudanese kitchen. The second artist is Hiba Ismail, and her work uh, complicates through the use of uh, the Red Sea. Her work that we're going to be showing today is a recent work. It's from the 30th of June, uh, 2021. And it's about um, uh, a cleaning of the beach. And it shows how not only the, the, the pollution in the Red Sea is caused by littering, but it's also by the ships dumping most of this waste in the Sudanese international waters because of the loose regulations. We would like to thank very much the uh, well, thank Reba and Omar Tijani. Please join us for our next uh, Fadas coming up as well. You can read all about it. It's very easy. You can go onto our website, getfada.com, and read all about it. It's a nonprofit, and it's for you, and it's for the community, and for you to show support. Thank you very much. And now I'll move it over to Amr Tijani. It's a great opportunity that Shabak and Get Fada have combined to do this type of collaboration so we can see what people have been working on in this difficult year. So I'm really thankful for the opportunity. Uh, thanks for letting me be here. My name's Omar. If uh, those who don't know me, I'm Omar Tijani. I'm Sudanese British and I'm writing a recipe book about traditional Sudanese food. Um, I actually have been involved with Shubak before. Uh, that was back in 2017. But I'll go over that in a sec. I'll just start with a little presentation just about my work. One second, bear with me. Hopefully this works. Yeah. And bingo. So hopefully you should all see this. Uh, these are just my links so far. It's my Instagram and Twitter, my Facebook and my YouTube respectively. I sh really should have put the website, but it's really straightforward. It's just SudaneseKitchen.com. Perfect. So yeah, this is my work. Uh, my work is essentially around the preservation of traditional Sudanese recipes. I've been working on a recipe book, but for now, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to go into the anthropology of traditional Sudanese food, just to have an overview about what Sudan is um, and the type of food that uh, is eaten there and the reason why that food is eaten there. What kind of the story of food there, essentially. Um, so just a little background on Sudan, just to start off with. The, uh, Sudan is in northeast Africa, uh, neighboring Egypt, Ethiopia, Chad, many other countries. Uh, and the main language that's spoken there is uh, Arabic. Uh, the name Sudan actually comes from an old Arabic term, mean, meaning land of the blacks or land of the black people. This is because not just this particular piece of land, but the entire stretch uh, from where Sudan is today on, on the Red Sea coast all the way through to West Africa. It was also known as the Sudan or the Sudanic region or the Sudan Belt 
of the Sahel or many other many other names. But then as uh, so Arab, Arab Arab scholars also applied this name to the whole the whole region, the whole belt from where Sudan is today, all the way westwards into West Africa. So that was all the Sudan. So as as time went on and borders became established, the name Sudan came to to stick to what we now know as Sudan. Um, or or at least back then it was Sudan and, and, and South Sudan. But we'll get onto that in a second. <clears throat> so Sudan had the first African civilization in the Nubians and they settled in northern Sudan. Uh, this is an area called Nubia. Um, no, my cursor doesn't appear, but it's in northern Sudan in this desert-like area. Uh, as I said, Arabic is the main language and Islam is the main religion. However, there are many other languages and religions practiced in Sudan. It's an extremely diverse place. It's not just to be thought of as just an Islamic country. It isn't. Uh, and neither is it just an Arabic speaking country either. There are many other local languages spoken. So the the region was actually Sudan as a, as a country was was colonized numerous times, and it's the reason why we have so much diversity. Uh, probably first by the Egyptians, essentially, but then onwards uh, Arabs and then Turks, and then finally British colonization uh, just created a big influx of people uh, from different backgrounds and created sort of um, I guess a melting pot of, of what we see today so it's not just the people that are diverse the land is extremely diverse as well I mean it's it's a colossal size of land what you're looking at here is actually Sudan and South Sudan I just thought it was a nice map because it shows the topography topography of the land as well and also just to reiterate the point that that this is Sudan and South Sudan there's a red border that divides them here and the south unfortunately seceded in 2011 but this map does let you see the fact that there's arid desert in the north it becomes more lusher in the south and there are actually mountains on either side so there's mountains in the red sea hills to the east and there's also a big mountain range uh, Jabal Marra over to the west in Darfur and as you move into Sudan it becomes a lot more tropical uh, in climate there's even like marshlands in between so unfortunately, Sudan has been in a nearly constant state of civil war since independence from the British in 56, and South Sudan seceded in 2011. There was a revolution to overthrow uh, a very difficult regime for almost 30 years. Um, that happened in 2019, and there's been a new government since. However, they're finding their feet um, for a whole host of reasons. Wish them the best of luck, of course. So that's my little brief about Sudan, but this is now essentially the main the main crux of, uh, of my research and my work. This is a map of the ancient routes, uh, like these are old cities, old capitals essentially, uh, from different civilizations uh, way back when. And I'm going to annotate it and explain the different food ways that have passed in and around Sudan at the time. So this map is essentially a map of the, the old connections, what, what some would say the Silk Road is, but it just shows trading routes between different regions. And I'll explain where Sudan is here. It's actually just below Egypt, where it says Egyptians there. So that's where obviously we start. So Nubia, as we mentioned, is in northern Sudan. Uh, the Nubian civilization was around about 5,000 years ago or, or 3,000 BCE. Uh, the people who lived there at the time would mainly live off the river Nile because uh, it was the main life force in the region. They would fish in it. They would um, yeah, get their water from it as well, but also they would eat some wild herbs that were from there as well. Uh, records say, state that there wasn't actually a lot of cultivation that was going on, but people were living off the land. And what also must be noted is that the, the desert, the Sahara Desert as we see it today, uh, has been a, is going through an ongoing process of desertification which means becoming more like a desert it means the area is becoming drier and drier so a long time ago about 5,000 years ago the, the the region wouldn't have been as dry as it is today so it'd be much lusher there's records of um, I guess meadows or like green pastures and even where the desert is today so the the desert's been drying out this whole time <coughs> Um, what were they eating and drinking at the time? They were probably making breads, is what we got records of as well. 
as well as wines and beers, things like this. They also slaughtered a lot of uh, cattle, uh, so it's likely that they ate a lot of uh, beef as well. So, about 2500 BCE, a little bit later, about 500 years later, uh, the ancient, there's records that, that state there was contact made between the ancient Indian civilization of the Indus Valley, which is today in between Pakistan and India. And this civilization taught the ancient Nubians to use uh, spices such as cumin and coriander, as well as relying on the abundant local grains that were, that were available in Nubia at the time. This would be millet and sorghum. And from this point on, we start seeing uh, like grain stores or like the storing of grain or the, the active cultivation of grain or the planting of grain. So a big reliance on, on grains. So you might have missed it, but there's a cross with uh, the first first century here. That's the uh, the Byzantine Empire <coughs> that, that grew in modern day Turkey and that, that made contact into uh, into Nubia from the first century, in fact. And even from that period onwards, Sudan henceforth became a predominantly Christian nation. There was there's still churches there, but the church was very prominent. In northern Sudan at the time, uh, up until the arrival of Islam shortly afterwards, and in this period, uh, sort of <clears throat> Eastern Mediterranean foods, but early ones, maybe simple salads, different types of bread, different vegetables, maybe would just would they would have had access to them, and people would have brought them in with them into into Nubia. So, a little bit later, about seven hundred CE. Um, Islam became very prominent in Mecca and uh, henceforth people travelled from that region from the Arab Peninsula generally <coughs> into Egypt and northern Sudan so there's records that contact was made with the Arabs which uh, you know obviously at that point onwards they they would call the region the Sudan and then they would they would travel there quite a lot and they would go there would mainly be men going there and these men would would go and settle in Sudan or the or Nubia at the time and essentially challenge the establishment, the Christian establishment at the time, and try and get uh, into positions of power. They even uh, managed to do it quite successfully, well, very successfully, but they managed to do it quite effectively over a long period of time, about 700 years, uh, when there was an agreement between the Christians and the Muslims at the time, to uh, just to kind of make sure there was uh, peace uh, and stability in the region. But the Arabs managed to to assert their power by marrying into uh, influential families and essentially taking over uh, through marriage in in a relatively short space of time and uh, changed changed the society from being quite a matriarchal society into a patriarchal society which is still what we see today so um middle eastern foods at the time would have been brought in but um this was quite you know the I think there's more influence being made a little bit later, about the 10th century, at the golden age of, of, uh, of Islam and the Islamic empires. I think uh, at the beginning stages there wasn't much influence, but as, as, the, Arab, uh, civiliz as the Islamic civilization grew, um, so too did the cuisines that they made, and that would have been also brought into Nubia uh, as, as that became more, more Arab and Muslim. So, as Islam spread across northern Africa, uh, on its return, um, I'll rephrase that. So, as, as Islam spread over the spread across Africa, many new converts to Islam would take uh, a road through from West Africa through Sudan to get to Mecca on an annu annual pilgrimage uh, called the Hajj. This would essentially be done by Nigerians or northern Nigerians from the Hausa and the Fulani people who had already developed their own fermentation and preservation of foods at the time. This is things such as Asida and Kisra, which we see in Sudanese food. Bear with me a second. Hmm. So the preservation and the fermentation of food is a technology that's very African. 
the also reinforced uh, African cooking or food preparation techniques into into Sudan or into this region, which, as I said, was already being quite intensively Arabized by the spread of Islam from the from the uh, Arabian Peninsula. So we really start seeing a reinforcement of African cuisine and African food technology into Sudan through the movement of these people, which is yeah, it's great. It's good to see that there's a a balance at least and as it's becoming more uh, Arab and Islamic, it's also becoming African as well at this, in, a, in a similar way. And it gives you an idea that Sudan is is the way it is because it's, it's constantly pulled between two very monumental forces, essentially. I should have put some water next to me, so you'll have to bear with me. <laughs> okay, where are we? So, uh, around the 15, yeah, 15th century, uh, the Ottoman Empire of modern-day Turkey became very prominent and annexed Nubia and, and, and the whole of Sudan, actually. So uh, the whole of Sudan became under their uh, their control, and this brought uh, Turkish foods into, into into Sudan as well. So as I mentioned before, like there's uh, very African foods that are that contain food preservation and fermentation. Uh, this could be, for example, something called mulah, which is like a gravy or a stew. And this would be served with something like asida, which you can see on the bottom here. It's like a, a dumpling of sorts. It's like a fermented grain dumpling. <coughs> and uh, so this is contrasting the, the types of foods that the Ottomans would have brought over, which are a bit more um, refined, let's say, a bit more like uh, subtle flavors but also yeah um, making good use of local vegetables and things like this so these are stews different types of stews that are called tabayr tabayr just means it's a, a cooked dish essentially so that's what the turkish brought into into sudan so again you're you're seeing more diversification of the cuisines uh, sometimes turkish eastern mediterranean Arabian and African so Sudanese food is 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 a fusion fruit for good reason because it has all these different influences coming from from different areas so another interesting point is that as uh, as the transatlantic slave trade continued from the 1700s onwards the the ships returning after taking slaves to South Africa South America would also be carrying South American food pro products that would then be brought into West Africa. Okay, so this would these would be South American ingredients such as cassava, chili, tomatoes, various types of beans, the peanut, the pumpkin, and the potato. So what's interesting about this is these are normally ingredients that we might already associate with African food already especially chili and peanut and cassava, of course, at least in my case. So, in, and specifically with Sudanese food, and there's one standout ingredient here, which is the peanut. It's very common in Sudan. There's two, two very different types that grow there as well. And uh, interestingly, the word for peanut in Arabic, so the word agreed upon by the Arab world for the word peanut is actually full Sudani, which means Sudanese beans. So the Arab world sees peanuts as uh, as a Sudanese bean, when in fact it comes from South America, as well as the other ingredients. So it was just interesting to see how, uh, yeah, foods shift and change, and I our idea of them uh, might be entrenched in in a particular place, but they might be rooted elsewhere. They might be native elsewhere. So it's interesting. So I thought I'd put a, a common Sudanese uh, tray of food and to go around and just uh, see the different influences that are, that are coming. So this is a really typical tray, uh, food tray in Sudan. Uh, I'll explain what each dish is. Um, so from top left here, it's a type of mixed salad, common in the region, but also the Middle East as well. Um, top right, one o'clock is falafel. But in Sudan, we call them tamia. Obviously, very common throughout the Middle East. 
not so common in excuse me in other African foods though. The next dish is ful, three o'clock here. It's essentially fava beans and that's feta cheese on top. Um, the Sudanese have it with oil, uh, sesame oil or whichever oil is available. Uh, and then that's feta cheese on top. At the bottom here is like a peanut chili dip. And next to it, seven o'clock is um, chopped liver. So it's chopped lamb liver cooked with some vegetables I could see and in the center this is what I was mentioning earlier it's mulah and it's served with a pancake bread on top there and that's called gurrasa so mulah is a rich stew uh, or a gravy that's made by caramelizing onions and then using either a meat base or, uh, or powdered meat and you you build it up with uh, tomatoes and water and spices and then it's all bound together with ground okra. It's a really common ingredient in Sudan and as well as other parts of Africa as well, actually. So the mulah can be served with either kisra, which are thin sor sorghum sheets, a bit like injera, but thinner and less sour. Uh, this is kurrasa, it's like a thick pancake bread. It's sometimes fermented, uh, but only with yeast rather than uh, with like an active ingredient in the sorghum. And lastly is the asida, which is fermented sorghum again, like kisra, but it's cooked into a type of dumpling in hot water. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is what we eat in Sudan. Islamic groups would start their meal by saying bismillah. Uh, Non-Islamic groups could say bilhana. Normally we eat on this circular tray. You might notice that there's no, um, there's no shared, uh, there's no individual plates. Everyone here will be sharing the same plates and everyone just eats from their side, ideally using their right hand. So this would be the technique for the typical dining at ticket in Sudan. And there's just a few do's and don'ts and obviously you don't reach over to the other side. And uh, yeah, it's, we also don't use cutlery, so it's, it's hand feeding and it's just cupping it very simply and lifting into your mouth. So that's, that's how and what we eat in Sudan. I'll give you a quick recipe. It's the chili dip. It's very simple, very easy. It's essentially peanut butter. I like to water it down with like a little bit of uh, oil or water. Water is fine. Just because if you rely on the lime juice to, to get it into solution, it can be a bit too much. Then you just want to put salt and chili powder. And that's it. Shot the deco. So, I'll just um, yeah talk about my next uh, next section. Um, this is a studio based out of Beirut called Studio Kawakib. They have this wonderful fund, and I was actually for Shabak 2017. I mentioned earlier, I designed a, a set of slides that we could use. Um, for a food memory installation, which we managed to install in Shepherd's Bush Market in 2017. And yeah, this is what we came up with. So this is the first slide, or this is one of the slides. It's okra. The reason why we put it in, in the star formation is so that when you superimpose these slides on top of each other, they're printed on Perspex, you can see through to the other ingredients and essentially we start building a plate. So we can talk about what foods we've eaten before just by collecting superimposing the ingredients one on top of the other yeah and we'll show you examples of that in a second so this is mincemeat these are the sliced onions some common beans better cheese yeah so hopefully you understood the concept this is my stall actually this is where i was uh my little space in Shepherd's Bush Market. You can even see some other slides in the photograph. So there's some chops there, maybe some potatoes, I think seafood and egg, some herbs or malukhiya, sausages. And this is my food memory uh, installation, which is really nice. Uh, it's actually quite coincidental that we were in front of a shop called Global Something. So this from the photo, it reads Global Food Memories, which is exactly the case. So because Shepherd's Bush is such a diverse market brings a lot of people together 
I had this stall there and people would come and tell me about their food memories from all over the world. So I'd, I'd invite the general public to take a seat with me. We would talk about what I'm doing, which is essentially working on the recipe book, but also doing this installation on on food memories. And they would take part. We would, uh, we would create different dishes from our memory, simply just by putting the slides on top of one another and then having a discussion around it. <coughs> So here's a very simple one. It's just the seafood slide with the pasta slide. That's it, really. So it's obviously just the seafood pasta. And this was an Italian lady who told me about how she loved going to the south of Italy and having fresh seafood with pasta and very simply seasoned, maybe some oil, and that's it. This was nice, like Italian food at its simplest, which is nice. This was potentially a Mediterranean dish because um, it's tomato paste, aubergines, feta cheese and onions sounds really nice, I really want to try this uh, and it looks really nice too I believe it's like Turkish or something or maybe even Greek uh, this was a masala you sometimes can't read the, the names but tomato paste it says molukhiya but she might have used uh, a different ingredient so the way this worked, I remember actually at the time that people would use the mulukhiya slide, even if it wasn't mulukhiya, they'd just they'd say it was another leaf. So we would like exchange the ingredients for other things, just so they could explain to me what the thing that they'd eaten. So this was a type of masala with, like I said, tomatoes, onions, uh, vegetables, there's a herb in there, and there's also some meat in there as well. So it's like a mixed, um, mixed masala dish. And I believe this is an Iranian dish. Have similarly as well, so lamb, onions, beans, potatoes, tomato paste, um, there's some type of leaf in there as well. So it's just nice to see how different communities and cultures build their dishes up. And you can see the similarities in between them as well. So that was really, it's really nice to have this opportunity to, yeah, to do something like that. It was a really fun, fun installation. I really enjoyed it. So I'm going to do a reading now, actually. This is just to, to sign off on my um, my time here. I'm going to do a little reading from, from this book called Sudan Retold. Uh, it's, it's an art book, essentially, about the history of Sudan that's, that's been retold by different, by different artists. And I have a short story in here about a lady who makes uh, a traditional drink. I'll just, just so you don't have a static image, I'm gonna Okay. All right. So here we go. Aisha the Fadadi. Uh, I'll start off with the blurb first. So I wrote this piece to offer a wider understanding of the relationship Sudanese people have with their food and drink. I wanted to tackle a few taboo subjects in succession to allow personal and or public discourse about these taboos and the influence of politics on them. The role of women in Sudanese society has traditionally been of the housewife, yet here Aisha is the breadwinner and caretaker, a role more often portrayed and a voice rarely heard. A fadadia is a lady who makes traditional alcoholic drinks such as Marisa, one of the oldest beers in the world and natives to Sudan. Aisha has been busier than usual lately since the government's clapdown on alcohol. Last year, 1983, the central government began closing down local bars that served alcoholic drinks as part of the, the an Islamic revolution. Alcoholic drinks like Marisa have been made in Sudan since the beginning of African civilization by the Nubians of northern Sudan over 5,000 years ago. In spite of the recent efforts of government agents, the age-old practice still continues. After cleaning her home, Aisha sets out to make Marisa, the beverage which final financially supports her and her 12-year-old son Malik. Using the money she made last night, Aisha, Aisha pops out to a local market to get breakfast items for herself and Malik and ingredients she'll need to make Marisa for tomorrow. 
She'll need regular millet flour and remembers that she already has sprouted millet flour and fatfato at home. The ladies at the market know her but look down at her and are not kind. Some snub her after learning that their husbands were at her place recently. Now they make Marisa to keep them out of trouble or worse, shame. After breakfast, Malik leaves for school and Aisha begins to prepare the same recipe she's been making since leaving her husband nearly 10 years ago. She brings water to a boil in her large pot and adds in the abundant millet flour from her region. Aisha used to use sorghum flour but, uh, when, she, when she moved her and, her and Malik away from her abusive husband in Khartoum, but she's been using millet flour since returning to Rafur. She liberally, liberally pours millet flour and mixes vigorously until the dough begins to harden and break into large and small dough balls. In her cleared hosh, an open patio area, she lays a palm fiber mat and scatters the dough balls over the mat to cool. Then fetches the, the ziria and fetfato which she prepares and stores in her humble pantry. Ziria flour is sprouted millet flour that promotes fermentation. But for Tawa, a sheet of fermented millet cooked into thin sheets like kisna, thin pancake type bread that accompanies stews. Aisha kneads the ingredients into, a, into the warm dough balls uh, on the mat by hand, then quickly transfers everything into a, into a fermenting jug, adds some water and leaves it overnight to ferment into marisa. Yesterday's batch should just about be ready for its first pour. It's 10 a.m. and the milder Marisa can be, can be sieved and poured. She's expecting patrons to knock on the door any minute. Two young men arrive, looking to take the edge off the morning, as they do most days before going to university. The mild version gives them a buzz they're seeking, and they laugh and frolic in Aisha's horse as they make their, then make their way into the streets with hazy smiles on their faces. Soon after they leave, they leave, Aisha prepares ghada, lunch for her generously paying main patrons. Marisa is usually served either as a meal in itself or as part of a lunch that may include barbecued meat. Uh, also onion, chili side, mixed salad, big leaf arugula. Lunch usually involves a larger group uh, who, after eating, will enjoy multiple cups of the now stronger Mirisa. A group of men arrive to eat, converse and enjoy one another's company, while Aisha prepares and serves Mirisa. She pours only one cup, called the Kas. One man drinks and passes the Kas to the man sitting to his right. After a few rounds, the men begin to feel sleepy and even take a light nap due to the Mirisa's strong sedative effect. Aisha doesn't mind, and makes her patrons as comfortable as possible. Marisa has always been tied to manhood and is often made for male circumcisions and other celebrations. Women normally, women normally drink Marisa in the privacy of their own homes and risk being shunned if others were to find out. The drink is, the drink is highly nutritious and strengthens the body and relaxes the mind. It comes in many different varieties and strengths and flavors to suit every mood. Its drawbacks include association with laziness, domestic violence, and alcoholism. Although Sudan is a predominantly Islamic country, Marisa is not regarded as, as haram or prohibited by the communities where it is, is, it is well established. So hopefully you, hopefully you saw all of that and you enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. I enjoyed all of this very much and I look forward to seeing more of these live events. Uh, thanks again for joining me. Have a nice evening.